Welcome to Michael's Record Collection. This is the podcast where we talk about great music with the people who make it and the people who love it. Joining me for this episode from the band Dead City Ruins, I'm happy to have with me guitarist Tommy Kane. Tommy, thanks for your time. No problem. Thank you. Dead City Ruins just released Shockwave. Album came out September 16th on AFM Records. The follow-up to 2018's Never Say Die album, and can't wait to dig into this a little bit with you. But before we start talking about the album, I want to know what your introduction to music was. How did you get uh, become interested in music? Uh, you know, in, as a kid. Well, uh, as a kid, I was very interested in um, that sort of. I mean, I grew up. I was born in 1988, so by the time I was about 10, I was sort of really interested in the whole grunge era. You know. Um, to 1998 and that sort of you know got it off to you know uh you know Pearl Jam Nirvana and you know and then I discovered Alice in Chains Metallica and and then just the list continued so and then I just was just very much interested in um in 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 the guitar space of that sort of stuff so that that was uh generally what was leading up to everything that was interested when I was in school. <laughs> so there you go. Was there, um, was there music in your family? Was it a musical family or no? It wasn't. It actually wasn't a musical family. It was very much a business orientated family. So the way I got into it was just uh, took the business ethic and then uh, contributed that into the music et you know, ethic and just stuck at it. Okay. Uh, did you have a first favorite record that uh, kind of sticks out in your mind? Yeah, I would say Nevermind. Nevermind was the first big one for me, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, and then i say after that was Injustice for All. <laughs> so, by Metallica. Yeah, so always always gravitated toward the heavy stuff. Always gravitated. To, and then it was Guns N' Roses and, and it just it just, you know... It was either you can't go too full on metal, or you can't go too full on rock. So I found the uh, in between. <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, were there any guitarists as you were growing up and learning the instrument that really sort of informed your playing? That you know, sort of you wanted to emulate or, or adapt some of their style into what you do. Uh, you know what? It's never been a. Uh, I've never really formulated. Uh, on a specific guitarist, I've taken all guitarists' uh, playing styles and and took everything on board. Rather than saying, "Oh, this this is the guy" or "That's the guy," never did it. Just um, just listened to a lot of guitarists and took it all on board. Rather than saying, "You know, this this that or the other is the best." Mm -hmm. So your band now, Dead City Ruins. Uh... You've got uh, a five-piece, Steve Welsh on vocals, uh, yourself on guitars, and Sean Blanchard on guitars, Thomas Murphy on bass, Nick Trajanovsky on drums. It's his second album with Dead City Ruins. And Steve's the new guy, right? Steve's the new guy. That's correct. And you guys have had a couple of different lineups now. Uh, you're, are you the, you're the last man standing from the original band? That's correct. <laughs> I'm the last man standing. <laughs> So I'm going to hold the fort. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me about the formation of this band. So you, you were there originally. So, you know, how did the band form? And then sort of what twists and turns to, did the band take over the last few years? Uh, the band formed in 2011, where, which was um, ba basically myself just on, you know, the old static web pages looking for musicians. Um, and it sort of got to you know, the forums and that sort of stuff. And I met a bunch of guys from uh, London that had come over and to Melbourne. And they were Australian. They were living in Melbourne. They came back to Melbourne. And it, it, they were just after the same thing I was after. I was just looking for a good time, rock and roll um, sort of band and just sort of try and uh, pivot towards uh, back to Europe. So that's how it all started back in 2011 and we had our first record out in that same year and we just sort of really aimed overseas and that sort of thing and which which worked well, you know, for a few years, uh, well, multiple, multiple years. So that's how it all started uh, formed and then we, uh, I uh, 
then uh, Blanche came into as as rhythm guitars not long after that, and then uh, you know over the years we lost a bassist and a singer and just replaced them essentially. And um, now we have Steve Walsh, who we hired in 2018. Okay, and uh, he sounds great. The whole band sounds good on this one. The uh, if you were going to describe Dead City Ruins music to someone who had never heard your band before. How would you describe it to them? I'd say it's powerful. I'd say it's uh, it's got everything that you would ever hear um, uh, if you were into rock and roll and wanted to hear something that was powerful and meaningful. Um, anything that was desirable in the formation of that early 90s to all the way to the 2000s rock and roll style. Okay. And you told me a little bit about your influences uh, and what you listened to as a kid. Uh, what are some of the other inf influences throughout the band? Is there anything a little that we wouldn't expect? Um, I would say um, there's, a, there's a little bit of blues there. Uh, you know, the old classics, Rory Gallagher. Um, but also is a massive uh, with Steve O joining the. I mean, it, it's always down to the lead singer, right? What he sort of justifies as uh, the style. And I would say that uh, Steve O is a very Alice in Chainsy sort of guy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but he he has a lot of uh, influences, and he can replicate all of them. <laughs> I've seen him do it, but. Um, yeah, I would say Steve-O is, he has his own vibe. He naturally adapts to any style and he sort of understands Dead City Ruins. But I would say he is a very uh, influenced by 90s rock, early 90s rock, that grunge era, Pearl Jam, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to, you know, he can do Megadeth or whatever, you know, <laughs> you, you name it. He's, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a big fan. I believe I saw on uh, Twitter, I think it was Nick that's got a Toto 4 tattoo. Yep. Toto, big time. Uh, Nick, Nick's a big Toto fan. I'm a big Toto fan. Um, I'm especially a fan of Steve Lukather mm -hmm. um, as a guitar player. But, uh, and yeah, I mean, I would say that, uh, that you know, the, the rhythm section as far as Zell, uh, Sal is concerned. Um, yeah, he, he is a big Toto fan, and that, that's what uh, kicks all, a lot of the rhythm section off. Yeah. And the, you know, the drumming section. So let's talk a little bit about Shockwave. Uh, when did work start on Shockwave, and, and how long did it take from, from start to finish? So work started on Shockwave. Uh, when we when we got Steve-O, which was to, uh, early uh, early 2018. I, I'd say even late 2017. And Shockwave started when um, we had touring opportunities pop up 2000, 2018 for overseas. So we had to get Steve-O. Uh, luckily, we found him. And then we, we sort of worked with him throughout 2018 and 2019 with him, um, especially 2000. Oh, sorry, got my uh, years mixed up here. It was late 2018, early 2019, and then we had the touring cycle start. And um, yeah, we uh, we we worked all through that 2019 with Shockwave. So that was uh, sort of tour start 2019, and then mid year all. Um, all album work, and then late year was touring again, and then album recording. So it was two tours, album album construction and recording in the one year. Hmm. Now, tell me a little bit about how the writing process is. How do you guys approach writing? Does everybody bring in a bit and you build off them? Is it is it from jams? Is it uh, you know do people come in with complete songs? Is it is it everybody in, or is it one main writer? How does that work in your band? A uh, uh, good question, actually, because <clears throat> usually what happens is, is Sean and I will come up with a riff, and then we or or Steve O, but you generally Sean and I will come up with a riff, and we just uh, bounce ideas straight away off that riff and generate a song, and that that's how it works. There's no 
there's no um it, it is a collaboration between myself sean and steve-o with the working of the songs mm-hmm. and that that's how it all works i mean there's no sort of like this guy that guy the other guy it's all a bit of a collaboration between us three and we all work the room and or work the office in front of the computer so to speak yeah um you know and and that's how we do it and that's how we nail it so there's no um there's no mucking around we get to work and we and there's no uh so i would say you know 90 percent of those songs on the shockwave are all generated riffs and ideas in a room in a small room and at or a rehearsal room and yeah and that's how we do it what about lyrics is that left to steve or do you guys work on them together all steve all steve so um i didn't have any input whatsoever on the lyrics i think sean had a bit of input on a couple of the songs but it's all steve and his ideas and what comes to his head and how he thinks the world is and that's how he does it yeah all right um so you talked a little bit about the writing uh what did the producer gene freeman bring to the album and and how did you end up working with uh with him well gene gene was the guy that we um machine was a guy that we had in mind since 2015 so we we had uh skyped him years ago talked about doing an album he was like yeah you know that'd be really fun blah, 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 blah. and then uh when it got serious it came down the crunch and we knew steve o was our new guy we just emailed him and said what are you doing in uh, late 2019 and he was like i'm free uh how do you want to do it uh, we were really respectful of his work in the past. We really loved everything that he had done and achieved as a producer. So, and, and a, you know, as far as he's got his ranch and stuff in Texas, he, he's got a, a really good setup there. So we, uh, we were really uh, flabbergasted at his achievements in his work. So we, we said, how do you want to do it? we can get everything set up in Melbourne for you. And he said, yep, let's do that. I'll come over. I'll get you guys in your territory and let's do an album. We sent all the pre-production to him. He was really happy with it and he wanted to do it. So that's how it's, that's how it did. That's how it worked out. Mm-hmm. Now, when you guys were recording this, I, you know, I don't know how the, uh, the world was over in your place. Like, were you guys able mm-hmm. to get all in a room or did you guys have to come in at separate times? How did the recording go with the pandemic? Uh, well, the, the recording was actually done in 2019. It was late That's just before. before the pandemic. So we were really lucky uh, to be able to get everything nailed in 2019. And here we are in 2022, and it's just been released. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it, t- it took some time, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, there was, uh, d- there was definitely a, through, uh, a few things that were thrown to the wind that sort of um, took its course and, and delayed a lot of things so we weren't we weren't um gonna release it until you know the whole thing was done Mm -hmm. you guys are known as a sort of a relentlessly touring band how how much time do you guys spend on the road in any given year well our last couple of years not much uh this year um this year we've only sort of done australia and but been getting every everything ready for uh you know, the release of the album, which we knew was going to take time. We knew that we were going to, you know, do some gigs in Australia. And then once the full effect of the album was out by 2023, we'd be back overseas. So I would I would say in the last three years, not much has been happening. But I think that's a general consensus on any band. Yeah. Um, but in, the, in previous years, yeah. Like in 2019, we did two tours overseas. And year before that, as as well, we did a tour. Of, so, you know, generally, we'd like to be over in Europe once or twice a year. Okay. So when you say overseas, yeah. where do you go? Like, t- walk me through the countries where you, you guys visit, typically. Oh, so oh, so uh, we, we would, um, I mean, our record label's in Germany, right? So, mm-hmm. and our manager's in Germany. So we, we would usually hit, uh, you know, the Schengen zone of Europe. And then um, if all 
you know, so you, you get your Germany, your Austria, your France, your Switzerland. Um, you've got your Czech Republic, uh, Spain, if possible. Uh, and then, and then if touring, uh, you know, if we, if we can do it, we hit England. So especially London or whatever, but, um, it depends what tour we get. I mean, sometimes we hit all of England. So, um, but yeah, it all depends on what tour we get, but I would say predominantly, yeah, it's, it's those, yeah, even, uh, you know, Sweden, you know, or, uh, Copenhagen or uh, Norway or whatever. So mm. it, uh, it it all depending on what the tour is, but that predominantly those those zones. Yeah. What how what's the climate like musically in Australia for your type of music? Because I know it's pretty good in Europe. Yeah. So that's why we do hit Europe is because the climate here is. I mean, we've got a population of twenty million people for the whole country. So. When you put in perspective, when you got a population of eighty million people of Germany and France, and and you got a population of you know thirty to fifty million in Austria, it, it makes a big difference. You know, you got a lot more rock and rollers hanging out there than you do down here. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Shockwave. It's twelve songs. You guys have done videos for a few of these, and one of those is Preacher, the first song that that the song that kicks off the album and right off the bat we're going full on anthemic rock with the hey hey hey's and and yep. that that's come up on a couple of songs that that type of thing comes up on a couple of songs in this album is that something that you go out of your way to court or is that just kind of naturally come up in the in the recording and writing process well i mean we really like uh festival songs so when we watch bands or listen to bands um, what's something that gauges our attention is like big intros, big haze, big collaborative uh, vocals. That's was something we wanted to achieve and we like doing. So that's how the song structuring worked around a lot of those songs was to, hey, you know, let, let's uh, let's get some chants going. Let's get some crowd interaction going. And that's that's what a lot of the songs were based around was crowd interaction as opposed to uh let's write it for ourselves because in a, a lot of ways writing for yourself is fun but it's not as fun when you're writing a song for the crowd as well and everyone gets gets it you know and you can all participate yeah for sure i'm not going to go through every track i want to hit some of the some of those songs that kind of stuck out to me though speed machine was one of those songs and another one that you guys did a, a video for and the word I wrote right. down, the word I wrote down for this song is relentless. This is a song that it might be my favorite song on the album. Uh, it's a great it's song. It's a lot of people's favorite. Yeah, it, it's a great song for Nick, and, and uh, it's a great bass and drum song. Absolutely, it brings out the band. You know, it brings out everyone's talents. And I got to say, you know, uh, Sean was uh, behind writing majority of that song, and he nailed it. So. Um, Sean and Steve-O and you know it was like that big macho heavy guitar intro with the macho drums and those those guys just nailed it you know mm -hmm. and there's not much more I can say <laughs> but uh <coughs> yeah it was it was a uh, predominantly a just a fast in your face hard-hitting song and uh, it came out really well yeah, it really did. You guys have a, a nice little dual guitar thing going on. Is that is that the yeah. two of you, or is that you doubled? Uh, no, it's two of us. We we always do our. If they, if you ever hear a uh, um, a dual guitar thing, it's always both of us together. Uh, Sean and I have known each other for you know since we're uh, you know for well, well, for thirty years now. So <laughs> I'm not joking. So and we're, we're very we're very aligned in our guitar playing. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's terrific. Uh, everything works in the song really well. And you mentioned earlier about the Alice in Chains vibe that that Steve brings to the band, and I think it pops sure. through in in the song "Rain." I think it really comes through. But also, there's something else beyond Alice in Chains in this thing. It's it's sort of got a little bit of a southern rock feel to the guitars. Like yeah, it's almost it's almost like Alice in Chains meets the Black Crows. Is that kind of what you were going yeah. for? Uh, you know, I don't know what we're aiming for there. Um, that was, I mean, that was a Steve-O song. 
you know, and he said, I've got this idea. I want to do it like this. And we all thought exactly what you thought. This is an Alice in Chains thing, but we wanted to put our spin on it. If Black Rose comes into the equation, then it comes into the equation. But we wanted to do that vibe um, on a particular song to really, you know, draw that attention. And, and it worked, you know, and we, we get a lot of that. Um, we get a hell of a lot of that. Like that's Alice in Chains style. And it is, you know, there's no, and, and you know what? Alice in Chains has been a heavy influencer, especially for Steve. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, wearing no. influences on your sleeve, you know. Um, exactly. <laughs> Dog on a Leash is another one of those good concert hall songs with the woes at the beginning uh yep and it, you know it's one another one of those ones that you know when you're playing festivals the crowd's going to get into it and and you get that the great thing about these is is that you get that immediate feedback at the beginning of the song that crowd feedback yeah 100 percent uh we we uh that was that was like a joke song to begin with <laughs> which was uh quite interesting it was just like uh this guitar bluesy lick that i came up with and, and everyone jumped on board with so it was just a really great um uh i would say creation of a uh, some sort of dead city that's dead city ruins in a nutshell i guess it was uh you know let let's make uh some sort of eddie van halen joke uh guitar start into uh a fun happy time song and that once again we wrote it for the we wrote it for ourselves and for the crowd. Yeah. Uh, the song Drifter is sort of this gritty, grimy, filthy sort of blues rock song. Uh, where did that one start? So that was very Slash the Snake Pit sort of uh, influenced, yeah. uh, which was me. Um, and that was, that's all of, you know, we wanted to write some songs also that were just, you know, people can pick up on and go, oh, yeah, I've heard this song before. Where have I heard it? And uh, but Because I'm, I'm also a massive Slash fan, and uh, I, I, I listen to a lot of Slash the Snake Pit, and um, I was like, yeah, let's do a song like that. And, it, and Steve-O was just perfect to nail it. Once again, you know, he just came into it, and that was that. Yeah, worked out. All right, it worries me whenever people from Australia start singing about spiders because y'all spiders kill people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah we got a few of them. <laughs> Maybe that's why you only have 20 million people there. Everything there can kill you. Um, yeah, but... pretty much. I mean, if you, if you want to go to the ocean, you're going to die. If you want to go to the outback, you're going to die, right? So, so try and – if you come here, just – just take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Again, th this one has a little bit of that Alice in Chains influence and uh, in the spiders yep. are never dead part of the chorus. Uh, really, really channeling Lane Staley and, and, and that Alice in Chains, uh, uh, you know, sound. Absolutely. And once again, it was just a, uh, we had to go where, the, where Steve, I wanted to go. So uh, once again, like let's, let's, Let's do what works. You know how to do it. Um, you know, he was like, I got this idea and we ran with it and it worked. And uh, yeah, we wanted to bring out that influence. The album Closer, The Sorcerer, I have to admit, I had a great time watching the video for this one. Yeah. <laughs> Who is the sorcerer in the video? I... Uh, Okay, so this uh, sorcerer in the video is a, a good friend of he's, We're actually up in Brisbane at the moment where he lives nearby here. Um, but he was, uh, he's a really good friend of us. He actually filled in uh, for me uh, when I was overseas uh, uh, earlier this year. He's also a really good guitarist, but uh, he's a um, really, he's one of our good friends of the band. So we, we thought, you know, let, let's chuck him in as the sorcerer. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, were you supposed to be the sorcerer in this video originally? Oh, uh, man, I, I don't think so. I don't think I could. <laughs> I don't have magic. <laughs> I can't do magic, man. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a clever video. It's fun. Uh, I like it a lot. And the song is great, too. So that helps. But uh, uh, overall, you. this is um, 
it's just you guys have got to be incredibly happy with the way that this album turned out it's uh, you know having heard some of your your older stuff i think this has a a cleaner production to it but you you maintain does, some yeah. of that um you maintain some of that grit in your music as well that's right we, we maintain the vitality of the uh the the the, the, the bolts and nuts of uh, Dead City Ruins, but we we did clean it up a hell of a lot. But that was uh, that was Machine Man. He knows how to uh, tidy bands up. He knows how to dust them off and throw them into the ring properly. And, and you know, it's, I don't think there's any other man who could do it for us. So uh, we were we were we were we were pretty lucky with you know, scoring that gig with Machine and him coming to Australia and saying, hey, guys, you're good, but I want to make it better. And that's how that's how it worked out. You know, he really tidied things up. That was Machine. Tommy, when somebody buys Shockwave and uh, they get the CD and they put it in their player and they turn out the lights and crank up the music and they listen to this thing start to finish, what do you want that listener to take away at the end of the experience? What do I want my uh, What do I want my people to get out of Shockwave? Is a very good question. I want them to be refreshed. I just want them to listen to the album and go, "Hell yeah, I've heard this many years ago, and it's back." That's what I want. I don't want. Uh, I don't want no friggin' guy pat me on the back going oh you're so good i want people to just be refreshed of what it, it was all about that's what i want mm. as a as a musician who makes or, or you know just trying to make a living you know playing this kind of music what is it exactly what is it uh, how do you feel when you hear people say that like rock and roll's over or rock and roll's dead or things like that ah, i mean that it's, it's a it's a state of mind i mean People can say it, uh, and I get it to a certain degree because the world is changing, you know, so dramatically. But um, I still believe there's always going to be those guys. It doesn't matter. It's girls, guys, whatever. It's, I mean, we went to a, a Darkness concert in Melbourne um, a couple of nights ago, and it was just amazing to see the turnout of those people still you know in their bedrooms or in their house houses listen to rock and roll and they get out and they enjoy it and it's not dead you know people say it dead media might say it's dead whatever but the reality is the people vote and they vote when they come out that's well said tommy kane the uh guitar player one of the guitar players for dead city ruins Australian band, new album called Shockwave came out September 16th on AFM Records. Where's the best place for people to buy this record where it helps the band the most? Um, the best spot to buy the record would be the AFM website, which is, uh, that, that's the our record label. So it's uh, afm.com. You can go there, you can score it there. If you're lucky, you can get it at your local record store. I know that there are the local record stores here in um, Australia. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as you guys in America, I mean, I would be looking at AFM or Amazon, see if you can score it there. Okay. Uh, it's been great talking to you, Tommy, about this record. I think it's a fantastic album. Uh, I've been playing it a lot. I've been playing it loud. And I hope it does really well for you. Thank you very much, Michael. I really appreciate it. And um, you know what? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I just want to give you guys, you a big shout out as well for whatever you're trying to achieve over there. And I, I think we, it's been a great interview, man. I, I really appreciate it.